Good evening, good morning, and good day wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night so that we may be like trees planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season so all that we do will prosper. This is week 20 of our 52-week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, Prophets, and Yeshua's words Reminding you that we are currently going through year one, which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion in Exodus. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, and the Hebrew-English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yah, we give thanks and praise to your great and mighty name. May you bless us as we are speaking tonight and sharing what we researched, what was put on our hearts. Father, may it be a blessing to those out there who are watching or listening, that it may encourage them, that it may help them, that it may give them inspiration. And Father, may your name be glorified in all that we do and all that we say. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, welcome everyone. A quick reminder that I dropped the PDF for tonight's study in the recordings channel. So feel free to download it and follow tonight's deep dive on your laptop. Or you can just follow the live stream on Discord. This is our master schedule and as you can see this week's portion includes chapters from Exodus, Jeremiah and Mark. We are going to deep dive on the Torah portion and we highly recommend that you would treat the Prophets and Yeshua portion at your leisure. Today we are deep diving into chapters 21 through 24 of the book of Exodus. And I just noticed that I forgot to update the picture. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let us begin. This is Exodus chapter 21, and these are the regulations that you will set before them. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he will serve six years, and in the seventh he will go out as free for nothing. If he comes in single, he will go out single. If he is the husband of a wife, his wife will go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears for him sons or daughters, the wife and her children will belong to her master, and the slave will go out single. But if the slave explicitly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. His master will present him to God and bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master will pierce his ear with it all, and he will serve him forever. And if a man sells his daughter as a slave woman, she will not go out as male slaves go out. If she does not please her master who selected her, he will allow her to be redeemed. He has no authority to sell her to foreign people, since he has dealt treacherously with her. And if he selects her for his son, he shall do for her according to the regulations for daughters. If he takes for himself another, he will not reduce her food, her clothing, or her right of cohabitation. And if he does not do for her these three, she shall go out for nothing. There will not be silver paid for her. Whoever strikes someone and he dies will surely be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait and it was an accident, I will appoint for you a place to which he may flee. But if a man schemes against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you will take him from my altar to die. And whoever strikes his father or his mother will surely be put to death. And whoever kidnaps someone and sells him, or he is found in his possession, he will surely be put to death. And one who curses his father or his mother will surely be put to death. And if men quarrel and a man strikes his neighbor with a stone or with a fist and he does not die, but he is confined to bed. If he stands and walks about in the outside on his staff, the striker will be unpunished. He will only pay for his inactivity toward his full recovery. And if a man strikes his male slave or his female slave with a rod and he dies under his hand, he will surely be avenged. Yet if he survives a day or two days, he will not be avenged, because he is his money. And if men fight and they injure a pregnant woman, and her children go out and there is not serious injury, he will surely be fined as the woman's husband demands concerning him and as the judges determine. And if there is serious injury, you will give life in place of life, eye in place of eye, tooth in place of tooth, 
hand in place of hand, foot in place of foot, burn in place of burn, wound in place of wound, bruise in place of bruise. And if a man strikes the eye of his male slave or the eye of his female slave and destroys it, he shall release him as free in place of his eye. And if he causes the tooth of his male slave or the tooth of his female slave to fall out, he will release him as free in place of his tooth. And if an ox gores a man or a woman and he dies, the ox will surely be stoned, and its meat will not be eaten, and the odor of the ox is innocent. But if it was a goring ox before and its odor was warned and did not restrain it and it kills a man or a woman, the ox will be stoned, and the owner also will be put to death. If a ransom is set on him, he will pay the redemption money for his life according to all that is set on him. If it gores a son or it gores a daughter, according to this regulation it shall be done to him. If the ox gores a male slave or a female slave, he will give thirty shekels of silver to his master, and the ox will be stoned. If a man opens a pit or if a man digs a pit and he does not cover it and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit will pay restitution. He will pay silver to its owner, but the dead animal will be for him. And if a man's ox injures the ox of his neighbor and it dies, they will sell the living ox and divide the money. And they will also divide the dead one. Or if it was known that it was a goring ox before and its owner did not restrain it, he will surely make restitution, an ox in place of the ox. And the dead one will be for him. If a man steals an ox or a small livestock and slaughters it or sells it, he will make restitution with five cattle in place of the ox and with four sheep or goats in place of the small livestock. And insights on chapter 21. Okay, there was uh, a lot in this chapter regarding restitution and retribution, and I'm going to speak to the retribution in the next chapter. But in this one here, I'm going to touch on the topic of slavery. It was God's will to protect Israel from exploitation, even in slavery. When you look at the Hebrew word for slave or slavery, it's servitude or service. It's interchangeable. We are servants of Yah, and that same word is slave of Yah. When this term is being used, putting servant in there, completely the same. In what we just read, is it slavery or indentured servitude? And I pose that reading through all of the other books of the Torah, it's indentured servitude. Slavery was permissible in certain situations, so long as slaves were regarded as full members of the community. So they weren't necessarily slaves, they were servants. They, they were serving because of the situation that got them in that, in that position. And they were as full members of the community. So they weren't lower people, they weren't lesser. They were full members of the community. It's just they had to serve a person or persons for their debt or whatever it may have put them in that position. They received the same rest periods and holidays as non-slaves. Anyone who was in servitude would still have all the holidays, the rest days, Shabbats, everything as everyone else did. They were treated humanely. And I put all the verses where you can check out the second witnesses and so forth on that too. Slavery among Hebrews was not intended as a permanent condition, but a voluntary temporary refuge for people suffering what would otherwise be desperate poverty. Cruelty on the part of the owner resulted in immediate freedom for the slave. So if the owner was treating them badly, that there was freedom from that position if they were being cruelly treated. This made male Hebrew slavery more like a long-term labor contract among individuals and less like the kind of permanent exploitation that has characterized slavery in modern times. The chief purpose contemplated for buying a female slave was so that she could become the wife of either the buyer or the buyer's son. As wife, she became the social equal of the slaveholder and the purchase functioned much like the giving of the dowry. Indeed, she is even called a wife by the regulation. Moreover, if the buyer failed to treat the female slave with all the rights due to an ordinary wife, he was required to set her free. She shall go out without debt, without payment of money. A girl or woman could be bought as a wife for a male slave rather than for the slave owner or a son, and this resulted in permanent enslavement to the owner. Even when the husband's term of enslavement ended, the woman became a permanent slave in servitude to the owner who did not become her husband and who owed 
her none of the protections due to a wife or do a wife. And continuing, the protection against permanent enslavement also did not apply to foreigners. Men taken in war were considered plunder and became the perpetual property of their owners. Women and girls captured in war who were apparently the vast majority of captives, as we see in, in, in many of the war captions, faced the same situation as female slaves of the Hebrew origin, including permanent enslavement. Slaves could also be purchased from surrounding nations, and nothing protected them against perpetual slavery. The other protections afforded Hebrew slaves did apply to foreigners. Even if they took the men, took the women, took them from war, or took them from other nations and purchased them, etc., and they were perpetual servants, they were always treated fairly, or they should have been. They always were treated fairly, they were always given the same holidays, and they were treated as members of society. And, as we read before, that those in servitude would have to circumcise. The males would have to get circumcised. They would have to come under the covenant and faith of Israel. The regulations in Exodus aim to preserve families intact. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. Yah's word in Exodus did not abolish the existing social and economic order but instructed Yah's people how to live with justice and compassion in their present circumstances. I think that's very important because th this social and economic order was in place. There were slaves in place at that time. And Yah's people were instructed to live with them with justice and compassion. So when they got slaves, when they had people that were in debt and needed servitude to get them out of debt, then they were all treated fairly and justly. We should take a look at the working conditions that prevail today among poor people in every corner of the world, including the developed nations. Ceaseless labor for those working two or three jobs to support families, abuse and arbitrary exercise of power by those in power, and misappropriation of the fruits of labor by illicit business operators, corrupt officials, and political connected managers, Millions work today without so much as the regulations provided by the law of Moses. So people today are in much worse conditions without the laws of Moses in place, where they're being treated fairly, where they're given these days and holidays off, and they're made as part of the community. So people today aren't even getting that. If it was Yah's will to protect Israel from exploitation, even in slavery, what does Yah expect followers of Christ to do for those who suffer the same oppression and worse today? It's a good question. Four main ways to become a slave. Extreme poverty, when they just couldn't provide for themselves, they might sell themselves as indentured servants. Or a father could sell his children into service of another. Bankruptcy, as a way to pay off one's debt. And restitution, if a thief had nothing with which to pay. And the laws about restitution. These rules convey the idea of carefulness with the property of others. And I think that's important because as you read all of these, and even when you get to the parts where it says an eye for an eye because you, you've done something, it, it's all of these results are to show you and everyone that you must be careful when treating others and treating other people's property, etc. You got to be very careful with it and not negligent, which leads into chapter 22, and I'll get into that more. If you dig a pit, cover it. If an animal falls into it, he shall pay the owner and keep the animal. So the animal falls into it, then basically he, he buys the animal and deals with the animal however it turns out. If your animal injures another animal, then sell yours and the dead one and split the cost. If the animal is known to hurt others, then the owner will pay for the dead one and keep it. So there, there's given these scenarios and situations of how to handle these situations so that people are doing things with justice. The moral dilemma laws spelled out penalties for offense, including many relating directly to commerce, especially in the case of liability for loss or injury. And that's my recap for chapter 21.
This is Exodus chapter 22. If a man steals an ox or small livestock and slaughters it or sells it, he will make restitution with five cattle in place of the ox and with four sheep or goats in place of the small livestock. If a thief is found in the act of breaking in and he is struck and he dies, there is not blood guilt for him. If the sun has risen over him, there is blood guilt for him. He will make full restitution. If he does not have enough, he will be sold for his theft. If indeed the stolen item is found in his possession alive, from ox to donkey to small livestock, he will make double restitution. If a man grazes his livestock in a field or a vineyard and he releases his livestock and it grazes in the field of another, he will make restitution from the best of his field and the best of his vineyard. If a fire is started and finds thorn bushes and a stack of sheaves or the standing grain or the field is consumed, the one who started the fire will surely make restitution. If a man gives to his neighbor money or objects to watch over and it is stolen from the house of the man, if the thief is found, he will make double restitution. If the thief is not found, the owner of the house will be brought to the sanctuary to learn whether or not he reached out his hand to his neighbor's possession. Concerning every account of transgression, concerning an ox, concerning a donkey, concerning small livestock, concerning clothing, Concerning all lost property, where someone says, This belongs to me, the matter of the two of them will come to God. Whomever God declares guilty will make double restitution to his neighbor. If a man gives to his neighbor a donkey or an ox or small livestock or any beast to watch over, and it dies or is injured or is captured when there is no one who sees, the oath of Yahweh will be between the two of them concerning whether or not he has reached out his hand to his neighbor's possession. And its owner will accept this, and he will not make restitution. But if indeed it was stolen from him, he will make restitution to its owner. If indeed it was torn to pieces, he will bring it as evidence, the mangled carcass, he will not make restitution. If a man borrows from his neighbor and it is injured or dies while its owner is not with it, he will make restitution. If its owner was with it, he will not make restitution. If it was hired, it came with its hiring fee. If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged and he lies with her, he surely will give her bride price to have her as his wife. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he will weigh out money according to the bride price for the virgin. He will not let a witch lie. Anyone lying with an animal will surely be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to the gods, not to Yahweh, to whom alone, will be destroyed. You will not mistreat an alien, and you will not oppress him, because you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You will not afflict any widow or orphan. If you indeed afflict him, yes, if he cries out at all to me, I will certainly hear his cry of distress, and I will become angry, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives will be widows and your children orphans. If you lend money to my people, to the needy with you, you will not be to him as a creditor, you will not charge him interest. If indeed you require the cloak of your neighbor as a pledge, you will return it to him at sundown. Because it is his only garment, it is his cloak for his skin, then what will he sleep? And when he cries out to me, I will hear, because I am gracious. You will not curse God, and you will not curse a leader among your people. You will not delay the fullness of your harvest and the juice from your press. You will give me the firstborn of your sons. You will do likewise for your ox and for your sheep and goats. Seven days it will be with its mother on the eighth. You will give it to me. And you will be met of holiness for me, and you will not eat meat from a carcass mangled in the field. You will throw it to the dog. Okay, thoughts and insights on chapter 22. Taking care of the less fortunate, homeless, oppressed, and the immigrants. I keep struggling with the word gear and how to translate it. And it can really mean either immigrant or alien resident, like green card today or proselyte like people that basically converted that chose to follow Moses law so in verses 21 through 24 we see you will not mistreat an alien that's the immigrant or the girl and you will not oppress him because you were aliens in the land of Egypt you will not afflict any widow or orphan if you indeed afflict him, yes, if he cries out at all to me, I will certainly hear his cry of distress, and I will become angry, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives will be widows, and your children orphans. Always, almost always, a widow, orphan, and alien go together when uh, we are talking about the less fortunate. What I see is a few things. So the first thing is, yeah, expect us to give them food and clothing. 
and I brought a few other examples in addition to Exodus in Deuteronomy 10.18 and he executed justice for the orphan and window, widow and he is one who loves the alien, proselyte to, or immigrant to give them food and clothing in Deuteronomy 14.29 and so the Levite may come because there is no plot of ground for him or an inheritance with you and the alien also may come and the orphan and the widow that are in your towns and they may eat their fill so that Yahweh your God may bless you in all the work of your hand that you undertake and notice that many times the Levite joins this group whenever Yah talks about this group because the Levite did not have an inheritance he was a guest in the different cities that were appointed to the Levites by the other tribes the Levite in a way was homeless so that's yeah, why he always lived outside you know, the cities yeah, yeah so that's why it was so important to take care of the Levites Deuteronomy 24 19 when you reap your harvest in your field and you forget the sheaf in the field you shall not return to get it for it shall be for the alien for the orphan and for the widow so that Yahweh your God may bless you in all the work of your hands and I included a few other examples the next thing that we need to do is we need to defend and pro defend and protect them from harm. So in Psalms 94, 6, 7, we see how the psalmist is basically lamenting about how the Israelites are treating the less fortunate. They kill widow and stranger. Stranger again is the alien. And they murder orphans while they say, Yah does not see and the God of Jacob does not pay attention. In Isaiah 117, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. In Jeremiah 7, 5 through 7, for if you truly make your ways and your deeds good, if you truly do justice between a man and his neighbor, you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow. You do not shed innocent blood in this place, and you do not go after other gods to your harm. Then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your ancestors forever and ever. So notice how Jeremiah takes idolatry, shedding innocent blood and oppressing the alien with the orphan is one and the same okay in the eyes of yahweh those are equal offenses that's pretty serious yeah well then we are supposed to execute justice for them here we saw if you lend money to my people to the needy to to the needy with you, you will not be to him as a creditor. You will not charge him interest, okay? We are not supposed to be creditors or bankers or whatever with the needy. Exodus 23, 6, you will not pervert the justice of your poor in his legal dispute. So we cannot put them at a disadvantage in the justice system because they are less fortunate. In Deut Deuteronomy 24, 17, you shall not subvert the rights of an alien or an orphan and you shall not take as pledge the garment of a widow. We cannot, as part of doing justice, we cannot take their last uh, property, like a garment, and give it away as a pledge. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, 19, cursed be the one who deprives the alien, the orphan, and the widow of justice. And all the people shall say, Amen. Isaiah 10, 2, to guide the needy away from legal claims and to rob the justice from the poor of my people, to make widow their spoil, and they plant their orphans. This is the description of the Israelites before they had judgment. The more we read Isaiah, and Jeremiah, the more we see that this was the main thing that Yah expected us, is to take care of the less fortunate. Jeremiah 22, 3, thus says Yahweh, act with justice and righteousness and deliver the one who has been seized from the hand of the oppressor. And you must not oppress or treat violently the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. And you must not shed innocent blood in this place. Again, oppressing them is equal to shedding innocent blood. 
Psalms 82.3, judge on behalf of the helpless and the orphan, provide justice to the afflicted and the poor. So providing them with justice, equal justice, is also an expectation from Yah. Then the last thing is to treat them compassionately and inclusively. So in Exodus 23.9, and you will not oppress an alien, you yourself know the feelings of the alien because you were aliens in the land of Egypt. So be compassionate, feel for them, you were there once. Deuteronomy 16, 11 and 14. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh your God, you and your son and your daughter and your slave woman and the Levite that is in your town and the alien and the orphan and the widow who are in your midst in the place that Yahweh your God will choose to let his name dwell there. And then in verse 14, and you shall rejoice at your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your slave woman and the Levite and the alien and the orphan and the widow that are in your town. So we are commanded to celebrate the holidays with them as equals. They are supposed to be part of the joy and the observance of the festivals. James 1:27 pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And then I wanted to share Psalm 146, which summarizes this motif of orphan and widow and the Levite and the alien. So the motif of the orphan and the widow is repeated numerous times in the book of Psalms and the book of Job. Yah is described in the book of Psalms as the father and savior of the orphans and widows. This is to encourage their broken and oppressed spirits, to warn us against harming and hurting them, as well as to encourage us to be compassionate and have mercy on them. Psalms 146 Praise Yah! Praise Yahweh, O my soul! I will praise Yahweh while I live. I will sing praises to my God while I am still alive. Do not place trust in princes, in a son of humankind with whom there is no deliverance. His breath departs, he returns to his plot. On that day his plans perish. Blessed is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is on Yahweh as his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, the one who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who give food for the hungry. Yahweh sets prisoners free. Yahweh opens the eyes of the blind. Yahweh raises up those bowed down. Yahweh loves the righteous. Yahweh protects the strangers or the aliens. He helps up the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked is thwarts. Yahweh will reign forever, your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Praise Yah. I'm coming back now to restitution or retribution. The law of equivalent retaliation, which also appears in Leviticus 24, 17 to 21, and Deuteronomy 19, 16 to 21, is central to the concept of retribution, as we just read in the previous chapter, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, etc. And that's what the law literally says, to pay, pay with a life, and what they did to you, you do to them, as found in the last chapter. The list is notab notably specific. When Israel's judges did their work, are we really to believe they applied punishments in this way? Would a plaintiff who was burned due to someone's negligence really be satisfied to see the offender literally burned to the same degree? This would be a test of mercy from the victim, in my opinion. Interestingly, in this very part of Exodus, we do not see the law of equivalent retaliation being applied in this manner. Instead, a man who seriously injures another in a fight must pay for the victim's lost time and cover his medical expenses. The text does not go on to say he must sit still for a comparable public beating by his former victim. It appears that the law of equivalent re retaliation 
did not determine the standard penalty for major offenses, but that it set an upper ceiling for damages that could be claimed. When looking at this, the upper ceiling would be the eye for the eye. The victim has the, the choice to go that far to the person who did this to them. And then there was a minimum that they would pay for their suffering and time and loss of work, etc. So there was a range in, in that sense. And the upper ceiling was really dependent upon the victim's mercy. And that, I, I think, speaks a lot. Thus, it would be quite possible for injured parties not to insist on their full rights under the law of equivalent retaliation, but negotiate a lower settlement or even forgive the offender altogether. All right. So I think I hope that explained the retribution, the eye for the eye, foot for foot, etc. I think that was a good overview of understanding the laws with the minimum and then the ceiling or maximum that one could do for negligence. Now let's talk about thieves and money. It talked about thieves in this chapter and then also money. The specific instructions about restitution and penalties for thievery accomplished two aims. First, they made the thief responsible for returning the original owner to his original state or fully compensating him for his loss. I think those laws were obviously pretty fair. Money and collateral. Laws regulated money and collateral. Two situations are in view. The first pertains to a needy member of God's people who requires a financial loan. This loan shall not be made according to the usual standards of money lending. It shall be given without interest. The other situation foresees a man who puts up his only coat as collateral for a loan. It should be returned to him at night so that it can sleep without endangering his health. In Exodus 22, 26-27 we read that. Does this mean that the creditor should visit him in the morning to collect the coat for the day and keep doing so until the loan is repaid? In the context of such obvious destitution, a godly creditor could avoid the near absurdity of this cycle by simply not expecting the borrower to put up any collateral at all. And I think that's what you just covered in, the, in your mm -hmm. slide there, that for someone that's in this situation, the expectation is no collateral. It's, once again, your mercy to extend this loan to someone without interest and in hopes that they will pay it. And if they don't, then we all know what happens in Scripture. What comes around goes around. They're going to be held, held liable for that in one way or another. Okay. Throughout the deep dive this week, I have some random thoughts, like verses that caught my attention. And here are a couple of them. The first one, not only we shouldn't interact with witches, sorcerers, magicians, we should, we should, resuscitate. We should not resuscitate, nor not sustain and, nor sustain and support their livelihood. I meant should not, okay. So in Exodus 22:18, it says, a witch or sorcerer, you shall not let live. And the word in Hebrew is techayem. And interestingly enough, I found that word only in one other place in the Torah and in fact in the Bible. And that word appears exactly the way it appears here, techayem, in Deuteronomy 20.16. There it says, uh, Yah is telling the Israelites about the upcoming con conquest of Canaan. And he says, but from the cities of these people that Yahweh your God is giving to you as an inheritance, you shall not let anything leave that breath. Techayem. So what, what is Techayem? It's an interesting command because it, it doesn't tell us to kill them. It just says don't support, don't sustain they're alive, don't resuscitate if they're about to die, or th that's what I'm hearing, okay, with that word. I think the meaning is to not sustain or support their livelihood. Rather than kill them, just don't support them. In Exodus 7 11, and Pharaoh also called the wise men and the witches sorcerers, and they also the magician of Egypt did likewise with their secret art. So I'm just, uh, I just wanted to show you three other places where that word witch or sorcerer appears. So it appeared 
in relation to the magician sorcerers of Fort Pharaoh. Then in Deuteronomy 18.10, there shall not be found among you one who makes his son or his daughter go through the fire, or one who practices divination, or an interpreter of signs, or an augur, or which sorcerer. Again, the same word. Um, and then in Malachi 3.5, then I will approach you for judgment and I will be a swift witness against the witches, the sorcerers, and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against the oppressors of the hired worker with mm. his wages, the widow and the orphan and the abusers of the alien and yet do not fear me, says Yahweh of us. So I find it interesting that he are groups together which is sorcerers with adulterers, those who swear falsely, oppressors of the hired worker, the widow and the orphan, abusers of the alien, and those who do not fear him. It's food for thought. Then in verse that caught my attention, Basically, I personally grew up with the doctrine that we are not supposed to take an oath with in the name of Yahweh. But apparently, based on what I see in this chapter, we are, we can. So we are allowed to take an oath in the name of Yahweh. What we are not allowed is to swear falsely or to speak His name in vain. And we are most definitely not allowed to curse Yahweh. So Exodus 19.7, you shall not misuse the name of Yahweh your God, because Yahweh will not live unpunished anyone who misuses his name. And then in our chapter, chapter 22, verse 11, the oath of Yahweh will be between the two of them concerning whether or not he has reached out his hand to his neighbor's possession. That's allowed the oath of Yahweh. And then Exodus 22:28, you will not curse God and you will not curse a leader among your people. And in Deuteronomy 10:20, Yahweh your God, you shall revere him, you shall serve him, and to him you shall cling, and by his name you shall swear. We are actually encouraged to use his name when we take an oath. Yeah, I... I think that comes into play when a brother and sister or a brother and brother are, are communicating to each other and they ask them to do something for them or a favor or they need something and the other person agrees. Then they may ask, can you agree in Yah's name? And that way it seals the deal. It's like they're going to do it because if yeah. you're going to agree in Yah's name, you do yeah. not want to break that because it's it, then you're breaking the law. Yeah against Yah himself. So, yeah, that's why I think they did that. It's like you swear on your mother's grave type of uh, comment that people would say yeah. it's, it's mm -hmm. in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So those were our insights and thoughts on chapter 22. This is Exodus chapter 23. You will not spread a false report. Do not lift your hand with the wicked to be a malicious witness. You will not follow a majority for evil, and you will not testify concerning a legal dispute to turn aside after a majority to pervert justice. You will not be partial to a powerless person in his legal dispute. If you come upon the ox of your enemy or his donkey going astray, you will certainly bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of your enemy lying down under its burden, you will refrain from abandoning him. You will surely arrange it with him. You will not pervert the justice of your poor in his legal dispute. You will stay far from a false charge, and do not kill the innocent and the righteous, because I will not declare the wicked righteous. And you will not take a bribe, because the bribe makes the sighted blind and ruins the words of the righteous. And you will not oppress an alien. You yourselves know the feelings of the alien, because you were aliens in the land of Egypt. And six years you will sow your land and gather its yield. But the seventh you will let it rest and leave it fallow, and the poor of your people will eat, and their remainder the animals of the field will eat. You will do likewise for your vineyard and for your olive trees. Six days you will do your work, but on the seventh day you will stop so that your ox and your donkey will rest, and the son of your slave woman and the alien will be refreshed. And you will be attentive to all that I have said to you, and you will not profess the name of other gods. It will not be heard in your mouth. Three times in the year you will hold a festival for me. You will keep the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you will eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you at the appointed time, the month of Abib. Because in it you came out from Egypt, and no one will appear before me empty-handed. 
and you will keep the feast of harvest with the first fruits of your work, what you sow in the field, and you will keep the feast of harvest gathering when the year goes out, when you gather your work from the field. Three times in the year all your men will appear before the Lord Yahweh. You will not sacrifice the blood of my sacrifice together with food with yeast, and you will not leave the fat of my feast overnight until morning. The best of the first fruits of your land you will bring to the house of Yahweh your God. You will not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Look, I am about to send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Be attentive to him and listen to his voice. Do not rebel against him, because he will not forgive your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you listen attentively to his voice and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, I will wipe them out. You will not bow to their gods, and you will not serve them, and you will not act according to their actions, because you will utterly demolish them, and you will utterly break their stone pillars, and you will serve Yahweh your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from among you. There will be no one suffering miscarriage or infertile in your land. I will make full the number of your days. I will release my terror before you, and I will throw into confusion all the people against whom you come, and I will make all your enemies turn their back to you. And I will send the hornet before you, and it will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become a desolation and the wild animals multiply against you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you until you are fruitful and take possession of the land. And I will set your boundary from the Red Sea and up to the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert up to the river, because I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you will drive them out from before you. You will not make a covenant with them and with their gods. They will not live in your land, lest they cause you to sin against me when you serve their gods, for it will be a snare to you. Okay, so before we start, I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things on the Septuagint. Verse 18 and verse 22, there is just additional text. Uh, interesting, it's not like giving necessarily radically different information, but I thought it's interesting that they added a few things. In verse 18, they added... For when I shall have cast out the nations from before thee, and shall have widened thy borders, thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. And then in 22, it's a very short verse. It just says, if you shall indeed hear my voice. But they added quite a bit. They were saying, if you will indeed hear my voice, and if thou will do all the things I shall charge thee, with and keep my covenant, you shall be to me a peculiar, meaning a special people above all nations, for the whole earth is mine, and you shall be to me a royal priesthood and a holy nation. This word shall you speak to the children of Israel, and then it continues, if you shall indeed hear my voice, and, and so on. So I thought it was interesting, those two additions. And then another comment I wanted to make is whenever you see the word Red Sea in English, actually the Red Sea, th that term does not exist in, in the Hebrew Bible. What In the Hebrew Bible it's called the Yam Suf, the Sea of Red. So just wanted to make sure that you know that it's not called Red Sea in the Hebrew Bible. In this chapter I want to talk about the poor, go a little bit further. One of the most important of these regulations is allowing the poor to harvest or glean the leftover grain active fields and to harvest all the volunteer crops in the fields lying unused. The practice of gleaning was not a handout but an opportunity for the poor to support themselves because they were actually doing it themselves. They weren't just getting it handed to them. Landowners were required to leave each field, vineyard, and orchard unused one year in every seven, and the poor were allowed to harvest anything they might grow there. Even in active fields, owners were to leave some of the grain in the field for the poor to harvest, rather than exhaustively stripping the field bare. For example, an olive grove or a vineyard was to be harvested only once each season, after that, the poor were entitled to gather what was left over, perhaps what was lesser quality or slower to ripen. This practice was not only an expression of kindness, but it was also a matter of justice. 
Most people in developed nations, at least, no longer engage in agriculture for a living, and opportunities for the poor are needed in other sectors of society. Businesses can productively employ people with mental and physical disabilities with or without government assistance. With training and support, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, prisoners returning to society, and others who have difficulty finding conventional employment can become productive workers and earn a living. And I want to talk about bribery. And I'm going to hit several verses here of what scriptures talks about bribery. And it's actually quite, quite a bit of examples. So it's, it's something to take note of. And you will not take a bribe because the bribe makes the sighted blind and ruins the words of the righteous. And Deuteronomy, you shall not take a bribe for the bribe makes blind the eyes of the wise and misrepresents the words of the righteous. Further in Deuteronomy 27 and 25, Cursed be the one who takes a bribe to murder an innocent person. Psalms 15, 5. He does not lend his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Proverbs 6, 35. He will not accept any compensation and he will not be willing, though the bribe is large. In Proverbs 17, 23, the wicked will accept a bribe from the lap in order to pervert the ways of justice. So those accepting bribes are wicked. Proverbs 21, 14, a gift in secret will avert anger and a concealed bribe, strong wrath comes. Ecclesiastes 7, 7, surely oppression makes a fool of the wise and a bribe corrupts the heart. Isaiah 33, 15, he who walks in his and speaks uprightness, who rejects the gain of extortion, who refuses a bribe, who stops up his ears from hearing bloodshed, and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. That's one who walks in righteousness and speaks uprightness. And notice that the one who walks in righteousness stops up his ears from hearing bloodshed. So if you're hearing conversation or people talking about killing and war and so forth, you don't want to you don't want to be part of that. You don't want to be listening to that. And shuts his eyes from seeing evil. So anything on TV, anything you see that's evil that you don't want to be looking at, that's one who walks in righteousness. And then remember why we should keep these laws and apply them. The Israelites themselves were oppressed as foreigners. We read this in chapter 22 and in 23. Rehearsing this history not only keeps God's redemption in view, but memory becomes a motivation to treat others as we would like to be treated. God hears the cry of the oppressed and acts on it, especially when we don't. We are to be his holy people. That's why we should keep these laws and apply them. So I wanted to reiterate that since it's talking about these laws specifically in these chapters. Then I want to mention the Sabbath for land. It's a Sabbath for Yahweh. In Exodus 23, 10-11, we read, In six years you will sow your land and gather its yield, but the seventh you will let it rest and leave it unused. That's also found in Nehemiah. The poor of your people will eat. The remainder of the animals of the field will eat when doing so. And it tells us more in Leviticus 25, 3-7. You must not sow your field, and you must not prune your vineyard. You must not reap your harvest after growth. Your servant and your hired workers and temporary residents will eat. Your domestic animals and wild animals, which are in your land, will eat. So on that seventh year, you don't do anything with it as far as cultivating it. You let everyone eat from it. And I do believe you yourself could go out and pick stuff for what you need that day. But you weren't to harvest anything. But it's for everyone and animals to eat Interesting, even from. wild animals. Yeah, it's more or less leave it alone. Let whatever yeah. happens almost. That's yeah. what it's saying there. All right. And then I want to touch briefly on the three times a year all men appear before Yahweh. In Exodus 23, 14 through 17. The three times is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days you will eat unleavened bread, the month of Abib, and no one will appear before me empty-handed. So when you come, you're bringing something. Anytime when you go before royalty and you go before Yah, you are to bring something, some gift of thanksgiving. And here, unleavened bread you may bring. The Feast of Harvest, with the first fruits of your work, what you sow in the field, 
the first fruits is another time to go before Yahweh. And then the feast of harvest gathering, when the year goes out, when you gather your work from the field. And lastly here, Exodus 23, 33, I'm going to end with, they, these are the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, will not live in your land, lest they cause you to sin against me when you serve their gods, for it will be a snare to you. These warnings that they were given, that they are to be separate. They are to mingle with the other nations. They are to be separate, and, and there's a reason for it. He kept repeating that, that warning again and again. Okay, so again, I had some random thoughts and different verses caught my attention. So the first one, doing justice to the less fortunate is all about fairness and nothing about favoring or abusing them due to their social status. So we have two verses and both of them are saying actually something a little bit different. So in Exodus 23, 3, it says you will not be partial to a powerless person in his legal dispute meaning you cannot favor him or you cannot do a reverse discrimination or because of his status and in Exodus 23 6 it says you will not pervert the justice of your poor in his legal dispute basically it's all about fairness treat him fairly like you're treating anyone else and don't take his status into account and don't let his step impact or affect any change on your ability to do justice Justice. Then the next one, being partial and or taking bribes set us apart from Yah. It's the other side of being holy, literally. So in Exodus 23, 8, and you will not take a bribe because the bribe makes the sighted blind and ruins the words of the righteous. In Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 18, for Yahweh your God is God of the gods and Lord of the lords, the great and mighty God, the awesome one who is not partial and he does not take bribes and he execute justice for the orphan and window widow and he's one who loves the alien to give them food and clothing we can see here that even yah one of his characteristics is that he is not partial and he does not take bribes first samuel 8 1 through 3 when samuel grew old he appointed his sons as judges over israel the name of his firstborn son was joel and the name of his second son was abisha they were judges in Beersheba, but his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after gain. They took bribes and they perverted justice. So, okay, the last thought, you, you just touched on it. There are three more deem that are assigned for pilgrimage to the house of Yahweh. In Hebrew, they are called regalim basically the same word as regal, leg. So those are considered three legs, meaning you are supposed to pilgrim to where the house of Yahweh is. It ended up being in Jerusalem, but before it was in Jerusalem, it was uh, in Shiloh and they had to go three, they had to literally walk <laughs> three times a year during those holidays. Exodus 23, 14, three times in the year you will hold the pilgrim festival for me. 23, 17, three times in the year all your men will appear before the Lord Yahweh. Exodus 34, 23, three times in the year all your males will appear before the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel. And then Deuteronomy 16:16, 16, 16, three times in the year, all of your males shall appear before Yahweh your God at the place that he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and at the Feast of Weeks, which really it's the Feast of Oath, and at the Feast of Booth, and they shall not appear before Yahweh empty-ended. So when you read the history of the destruction of the Second Temple, they mention how Titus allowed the Jews to enter Jerusalem for Passover or actually the Feast of Unleavened Bread and now we understand why all of a sudden millions, I don't remember even how many ended up being stuck in Jerusalem but why all of them came because this is one of the three holidays that they were supposed to literally in person show up 
at the house, uh, at the temple, and celebrate the whole the festival there. The last the random thought that I had was about Malachi, a human prophet or an angel of Yah. You decide. In this week, chapter 23, verses 20 through 23, Yah says, Look, I am about to send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Be attentive to him and listen to his voice. Do not rebel against him because he will not forgive your transgressions for my name is in him. But if you listen attentively to his voice and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. And then Yah says, when my angel, in Hebrew, Malachi, when Malachi goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, I will wipe them out. And then, this is literally the only place in the Bible that we see Malachi and then we jump to the book of Malachi and it says, An oracle, the word of Yahweh to Israel, true Malachi, my angel. Again, the same word, exactly the same word. In Malachi chapter 3, 1 through 3, it says, Look, I'm going to send my angel, Malachi. I'm going to send Malachi, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you are seeking will come suddenly to his temple. And the angel of the covenant in, in whom you are taking pleasure, look, he is about to come, says Yahweh of hosts. And who can endure the day of his coming? And who is the one who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like launderer's alkali. He will sit as a refiner and pur purifier of silver. He will purify the children of Levi, and he will refine them like gold and like silver, and they will present to Yahweh offerings in righteousness. I'm just wondering if the last book, the last prophet, book in the Bible, literally the last prophet, Malachi, is Yah's angel, mm. and the same angel that he sent before them to help them conquer the promised land. Mm. Yep. Okay. Any questions or insights on chapter 23? Michael did put down, do you think Adam and Eve fell in the seventh year because they harvested the fruit that year? My thought on that is, depending on how you take the word harvest, but I, if they only took one fruit each, I don't think that would be a harvest. I would think that would be just them satisfying themselves in that sense. So I don't, I don't think I would consider that them doing a harvest and them being punished for that, if that was the question. But it's a good thought, though. Okay, we'll move on to chapter 24. This is Exodus chapter 24. And to Moses he said, Go up to Yahweh, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy from the elders of Israel, and you will worship at a distance. And Moses alone will come near to Yahweh, and they will not come near, and the people will not go up with him. And Moses came, and he told the people all the words of Yahweh and all the regulations. And all the people answered with one voice, and they said, All the words that Yahweh has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of Yahweh, and he rose early in the morning, and he built an altar at the base of the mountain, and set up twelve memorial stones for the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men from the Israelites, and they offered burnt offerings, and they sacrificed sacrifices as fellowship offerings to Yahweh using bulls. And Moses took half of the blood, and he put it in bowls, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the scroll of the covenant, and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that Yahweh has spoken we will do, and we will listen. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. And he said, Look, the blood of the covenant that Yahweh has made with you in accordance with all these words. And Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy from the elders of Israel went up. And they saw the God of Israel, and what was under his feet was like sapphire tile work, and like the very heavens for clearness. And toward the leaders of the Israelites he did not stretch out his hand. And they beheld God, and they ate, and they drank. And Yahweh said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain, and be there, and I will give you the tablets of stone and the law and the commandments that I have written to instruct them. And Moses got up, and Joshua his assistant, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. 
And to the elders he said, Wait for us here until we return to you. And look, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute will bring it to you. And Moses went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain, and the glory of Yahweh settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And he called to Moses on the seventh day from the midst of the cloud. And the appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain to the eyes of the Israelites. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud, and he went up the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. And one thing I wanted to mention before you go on to your next piece is we covered the sapphire stones in verse 10 being under Yah's feet when we talked about the Ten Commandments and the tablets of stone that were first given to Moses, the first set, that possibly those stones being the first set coming from those stones in heaven from under his feet. But that's in a previous chapter if you did not listen to that one. Okay, so our God is a consuming fire. So in verse 17 of chapter 24, and the appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain to the eyes of the Israelites. So then I have a few other verses to support it. So Leviticus 10.2, so fire went out from before Yahweh and it consumed them so that they died before Yahweh. Numbers 11.1, 1, and it happened, the people were like those who complain of hardship in the hearing of Yahweh. And Yahweh became angry, and the fire of Yahweh burned among them, and it consumed the edge of the camp. Numbers 16.35, and fire went out from Yahweh, and it consumed the 250 men presenting the incense. Deuteronomy 4.24, for Yahweh your God is a devouring, consuming fire, a jealous God. Deuteronomy 9.3, you should know today that Yahweh your God is the one crossing ahead of you as a devouring, consuming fire. He will destroy them and he will subdue them before you, so you will dispossess them and you will destroy them quickly, just as Yahweh promised you. 1 Kings 18.38 Then the fire of Yahweh fell, and it consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and the water which was in the trench it licked up. 2 Kings 1.10 Then Elijah answered and said to the commander of the fifty, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Second Chronicles 7, 1 And when Solomon finished praying, then fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of Yahweh filled the house. Psalms 21, 9 You will make them like your fiery furnace at the time of your appearance. Yahweh will swallow them in his wrath and fire will consume them. Isaiah 10, 15 through 19. The, does the axe boast against the one who cuts with it? Or the saw magnify itself against the one who moves it to and fro? As if a rod should move the one who lifts it? As if a staff should lift up that which is not wood? Therefore the Lord Yahweh of hosts will send leanness among his king of Assyria, sturdy warriors, and a burning like the burning of fire will burn under his glory, and the light of Israel will become like a fire, and Israel's holy one like a flame, and it will burn and devour his, the king of Assyria, thorns and priors in one day. And then Zephaniah 1.18, Moreover, their silver and their gold will not be able to save them on the day of the wrath of Yahweh. And in the fire of his zeal, the whole land shall be consumed for a terrifying end he shall make for all the inhabitants of the land. Hebrews 12.28-29, Therefore, since we are receiving an unshakable ki kingdom, let us be thankful through which let us serve God acceptably, with awe and reverence, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire, but he can also be many waters. Our God is also many waters. Ezekiel 1, 24. And I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of many waters, like the voice of Shaddai. And when they moved, there was a sound of...
tumult, tumult, like the sound of an army when they stood still, they lowered their wings. Ezekiel 43, 2, and look, the glory of the God of Israel, it came from the way of the east, and its sound was like the sound of many waters, and the land radiated due to his glory. Psalms 29, 3, the voice of Yahweh is over the waters, the God of glory thunders, Yahweh is over many waters. This led me to think about baptism of water and baptism of fire. Baptism of water is baptism of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3, 7 through 11. But when he, John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, therefore produce fruit worthy of repentance and do not think to say to yourself we have Abraham as father for I say to you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones already now the axe is positioned at the root of the trees therefore every tree not producing good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire i baptize you with water for repentance but the one who comes after me is more powerful than i am whose sandals i am not worthy to carry he will baptize you with the holy spirit and fire the baptism of the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit. These are the fruits that come with repentance. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. If we live by the Spirit, we must also follow the Spirit. Baptism of fire, on the other hand, reserved for those who do not bear fruit in keeping with repentance and obeying the law. This baptism of fire is clearly articulated by John the Baptist in conclusion of the passage quoted above. In Matthew 3.12 he says, He is winnowing shovel is in his hand and he will clean out his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the storehouse but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire the wheat are those who bear fruit in keeping with repentance and the law whereas the shaft is those who do not bear fruit in keeping with repentance and the law the shaft will burn with unquenchable fire, the fire of judgment. This baptism of fire is the immersing of the shaft in the lake of fire at the time of judgment. This will be the everlasting punishment as mentioned in Matthew 25, 46, saying, And this will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. One last thought. Some, when they think of the baptism of fire, think of the event in Acts 2. Many interpret this passage as the baptism of fire because Acts 2, 3 says, And divided tongues like fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. However, notice here that it does not say fire. Instead, it says tongues as of fire appeared. Too often people jump to the conclusion that this is the baptism of fire. Moreover, surrounding passages to this verse clearly describe this event as the baptism of the Holy Spirit and not of fire. Wow. Then I wanted to share another verse that inspired me, Exodus 24.4. And Moses wrote all the words of Yahweh, and he rose early in the morning, and he built an altar at the base of the mountain, and set up twelve memorial stones for the twelve tribes of Israel. So that reminded me of other chapters that we read many weeks ago. Okay, so in Exodus 28, 17 through 21, and you will fill it with stone mounting, four rows of stone, a row of cornelian, topaz, 
and emerald is the first row and the second row is a malachite, a sapphire and a moonstone and the third row is jacinth and agate and an amethyst and the fourth row is a turquoise and an onyx and a jasper. Their settings will be woven with gold. The stones will be according to the names of the Israelites, 12 according to their names with seal and craving each according to its name they will be for the 12 tribes so we see 12 stones also on actually on the garment on the ephod of the high priest in exodus 39 14 and the stones were according to the names of the israelite they were 12 according to their names with seal and cravings each according to its name for the 12 tribes again 12 stones mentioned in Joshua, we have a very interesting story about 12 stones. So let's read it. Joshua 4, 4 through 9. After all the nation finished crossing the Jordan, Yahweh said to Joshua, Take 12 men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan where the priest feed stood firmly and bring them over with you and set them up in the place where you will camp tonight so joshua summoned the 12 men whom he had appointed from the israelites one from each tribe and joshua said to them cross over before the ark of yahweh your god to the middle of the jordan and each one of you lift up a stone on your shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the israelites so this may be a reminder among you when your children ask in the future saying what do these stones mean to you you will say to them that the waters of the jordan were cut off from before the ark of the covenant of yahweh when it crossed the jordan the waters of the jordan were cut off these stones will be as memorial for the israelites for eternity so again we have 12 stones of memorial then joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the jordan in the place where the feet of the priest carrying the ark of the covenant stood and they are there to this day so in first kings 18 30 through 32 then elijah said to all the people come near to me so all the people came closer to him he repaired the altar of yahweh that had been destroyed elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of jacob to whom the word of god came saying israel shall be your name with them he built an altar in the name of yahweh and he made a trench which would have held about two seahs of seed all around the altar the memorial set up by joshua and the israelites to commemorate the crossing of the jordan river is described in joshua 4. the narrative slows way down and becomes a bit repetitive indicating how important this event was for the israelite what can be said about the memorial itself the text indicates that the memorial was composed of 12 stones they were to be carried from the place in the drive river bed where the feet of the priest stood as the Israelite crossed. The stones were to be carried on the shoulders of 12 men, one from each tribe, and taken to the campsite of the Israelites at Gilgal, east of Jericho. Standing stones have been found in numerous archaeological settings, usually in the context of a rel religious installation and the stones are nearly always placed in a line. Examples include the standing stones at the gate of Dan, those at the small Egyptian temple in the Timna Valley, and the very large standing stone at Gezer, to name a few. A fascinating example, I put a picture of it to the right, is the double row of 12 stones, six per line, that were set up on the plain below our Karkom. We actually passed through our Calcom when we were there last year. These are also approximately the size of stone that Joshua and the Israelites would, would have used and possibly the same size of that Moses had used too. So I just thought it's really interesting. Some scholars suggest that maybe Har Calcom is Mount Sinai 
I included the link here and you can go and read the debate but I don't think so because it's within the land of Canaan and they were outside Canaan when they were wandering in the desert and that's it for today any questions thoughts I got some questions. Okay. Your baptism of fire, I thought that was very interesting. Thank you. Since we're focused mainly on the tour pieces, I haven't really jumped into that. And I'm looking forward to that when we get to Yeshua's words. But I thought that was a very interesting concept that the baptism of fire is for the wicked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the way it came to me is I was just investigating the consume, Yahweh is a consuming fire. And all of a sudden I thought, wait a moment, there are also verses on many waters. So then I went and dug those verses and I got to the New Testament. And then from there it was it was a domino effect. Mm -hmm. I got into the baptism and then I thought, these are two different baptisms. These are, these are not the same. And they are indicating a completely different treatment by Yahweh. Yeah, I, I got to look into that because if that is, is what you're saying, that's interesting how people will proclaim that or say that. Let's baptism of fire. Let's come this, this Sunday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> Yeah. All right, and, and the next one was the 12 stones. Something that came to my mind, and I did a study on this. I know Michael and I have talked about it in the past, about the 12 stones. And I think we talked about it being a birth, birth stone for the tribes. The, the, the stones represent the tribes, which may be the month they were born in. They were all born on a different month. I know we've had that conversation, so it's a possibility. I, I think when we looked up the tribe member, the 12, the few that mentioned the month, they were in different months, but I cannot remember if we calculated all that way or not. But it, it was definitely a good thought, that oh, a possibility. Yeah. That would be nice to go back to Jubilees, because in, in the I think canon, they, the they don't mention. But maybe in Jubilees, we can see the month, and then we see that they are in a different... Right, and then you can line up the yeah, who's who and what, what stone. That's, that yeah. would be interesting. That's interesting, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me just look at the tickers. I actually found just a few sig uh, insignificant variants. I shared some of them with you between the LXX and Dead Sea Scrolls and LXS and Masoretic. Other than that, really nothing major. The text is almost identical. And again, we got most of the Exodus text for these chapters in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that's it for this week. All right, thank you. Father Yah, we give thanks and praise to your great and mighty name. Father, may what we share be an inspiration and a lightning to others. May it speak to them, may it help them. And Father, may it be a blessing unto your name. We ask that each and every week that we can continue doing this, that you and your name is glorified and that others will be blessed by it. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.